Hello, this is James Reese, and welcome back to another Spotlight on Technology with RazorWire. Today, we have Marie Hargraves from Immersive Labs. She is a workforce advisor. Um, Marie, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit about yourself, uh, a bit about your background, that kind of thing? Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me uh, on the show, James. Uh, so my background is I started off in the Royal Air Force in intelligence. Um, I then uh, moved on later into my career into the world of cyber. So uh, I started off in the Home Office SOC as an entry uh, cyber analyst and worked my way up to leading the protective monitoring team and um, the incident response. Uh, currently, I work with Immersive Labs and I am a cyber workforce advisor. And what I do in that space is I ensure that my particular account gets the most value out of all the products and content that we have and align uh, what I can to their strategies, uh, both tactical um, and strategic, uh, ensuring they get the most value. Fantastic. And it's it's great to have somebody from like our forces intelligence on here. Uh, some of the some of the background of a lot of what we discuss on this channel is around kind of intelligence or it's around sort of knowing what's happening or, t or testing things, trying things out. And indeed, today's content is going to be around that kind of crisis simulation, that kind of, you know, instant response testing aspect of information security. I mean, when we go back through time, as I always do with all of these kinds of videos, um, you know, 25 years ago, instant response was there. It was a, a bit of an IT thing, really, more than a security thing back in the day. Um, but it very quickly became apparent that, that we needed to start looking at security instance very, very differently from the way that we looked at kind of like the IT incident. You know, with IT, something breaks, you look to fix it, get it back up and running, maybe a temporary fix in the meantime, but ultimately you'll have a, a break fix that will it'll work and you can then kind of update your documentation to, to show what you did and if it happens again, how to fix it. As we all should know, being cybersecurity professionals, it's not quite as simple as that when it comes to a security event. Um, so fantastic to have Marie on. Um, so Marie, historically, your, your, your background, that's, that's pretty interesting. Were you, were you involved a lot in kind of almost wargaming, shall we, shall we term it that way for, for want of a better word, uh, in the military? Was it a big part of, of preparing um, different departments, the, the various different aspects of, of military life? Um, I mean, it's almost like drills, isn't it? Indeed, yeah. So obviously, being in the military, your whole purpose is to attack and defend. Um, now, we, yeah, drills, uh, you do your best to prepare for them. One of the ones I hated the most was when we prepared for a nuclear biological warfare every year and I got gas um, once a nice. year. That wasn't, yeah, yeah, that wasn't my particularly favourite uh, war game, should we say. Uh, so yeah, it, it's very much been a part of my entire career. Um, and what we do see though with war games and you know in every real day life, you just don't have time to practice them. And actually what happens a lot of the time with doomsday scenarios is they're doomsday because you've never seen them before and they can mm. impact multiple services, they can impact multiple um, you know, fields, people, processes, technology. And it's what we can do to ensure that we have the most resilience uh, when we look at incident response, like how can we prepare? Absolutely. I mean, for, from a large chunk of my career, um, I get to meet a lot of different types of companies and lots of different types of people in the in in this particular sector, and you know a lot of other sectors as well. And I tend to find with a lot of people, they 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 tend to have that kind of instant response procedure. But I mean, if they're lucky, they never get to use it. And I always postulate with those those people that I come across where they say, yeah, we've got an instant response procedure, but, but we've rarely ever had to use it. And it's like, well, how do you know it works? You know, how do you refine your instant response if you don't test it from time to time? Um, and a lot of them kind of look at me. Some some look at me like I'm mad. Others look at me and, and kind of say, actually, no, good point. You know, we've had this procedure for 10 years and we've used it maybe twice. But we've never done that whole lessons learned thing of it that, um, you know, maybe people in IT or people in other areas of business do. Because, I mean, you have business crisis management. You have, 
you know, crisis management for um, the military. You've got crisis management for all kinds of walks of life. Um, and a lot of kind of playbooks get built because that's, that's what they term it in the military, isn't it? Playbooks. Indeed, yeah. Indeed. So run me through like a scenario. What would they do? Would they just kind of, you know, not tell you what it was going to be, throw you into something completely blind and just see how how you respond? Yeah, they would. So basically what would generally happen is you'd get, you know, as part of your training, whether it's phase one or phase two, you'd be prepared of a certain amount of knowledge and then you'd be thrown into a scenario. Um, and they'd expect you to use your knowledge and apply it to that situation, um, whatever that may be. Um, but as you know, as you hit the nail on the head, uh, individuals change, businesses change, you know, people turn over, you have different people and different teams every year. So actually, repeatable exercising is sort of where we need to go when we look at any type of incident response. Absolutely. And I mean, the other thing is, obviously, if God forbid you had an actual incident, because you've, you've you dry run it, you've, you've tested that process, you've refined that process, when an incident does actually occur, you're far more prepared for, for dealing with that incident than if you didn't do anything. It's like, it's like drills at school, you know, the fire drills at school. Once every quarter or once every couple of months, you'd you know, all of a sudden the bell would go off, everybody would stand up, go outside, line up and all the rest of it. And we do that in court. We used to do that in corporate life. I, I, I don't know if we still do do that kind of thing. But, um, you know, drilling and making sure that everybody knows who's who, what's what. Because, again, with with security incidents, it's, it's a very, very different process we tend to have to follow. And there's very different people in that team that need to be involved. A, a lot of mistakes I see um, or I, I have seen historically is they just include kind of like security people, maybe some IT people in there. But with a security event quite often, um, especially if it's a high-profile security event, you really desperately need to have media, PR, you need to have representation from other areas within the business, legal maybe, even, may even need a legal representation because when events happen, it's very hard to predict where they're going to go, how widespread they're going to be. So having people from the right departments, the right areas of the business, prepped and ready to go if they are needed. They're not always going to be needed, but you know, maybe a virus, you know, maybe a computer virus kicks off. I mean, that's a bit old school now, but a computer virus would kick off. It'd be somebody in IT, somebody in security, maybe one or two of the the, the kind of management staff from around the business who who could sort of mention to the customer oh, we're having a bit of a bit of a down bit downtime at the moment you know bear with us everything will be back but um it, it's security has changed so much and the way attacks happen we've got ransomware now we've got all kinds of different um <laughs> attacks social engineering attacks is another good one there you know that are, are kicking off and we're not changing or we haven't historically changed the way we we test our instant response. It's a bit crazy, really. Yeah, definitely. And also throw into the mix the fact that COVID happened. And so yeah. adding that to the bag, how we work is completely different because there's a lot of us who are remote. Uh, and that also changes, you know, the business continuity plans, your incident response. Um, and you hit the nail on the head there. It's not just about dealing with the incident. It's knowing who to involve. It's mm. looking at your communication process. Do you have the right people? Do you know who to where to go to get the right people? And, you know, will they be working? So let's face it, a lot of the time, 24-7, it is only the IT teams plugging away in the background waiting for the next cyber attack. And you're probably not going to get somebody from the media team like willing to spin up a call at two o'clock in the morning so these are all sort of things that you know practicing your incident response your bcp will sort of help you identify so you can plug those gaps it's quite funny you should mention the, the whole pandemic thing actually because i used to do a lot of kind of uh bcp work back in the day disaster recovery that kind of thing and i had what what what, what was really kind of termed as the you know the level of woe as I, I used to term it, which was, it started off with something really simple like, you know, you can't get into the office because someone's forgotten the key kind of thing. 
all the way up to nuclear war and the whole universe is imploding, you know, and it's a level of what, what, to what extent are you going to try to recover before you just hold your hands up and say, that's it. I, I, I don't think it's recoverable, you know, and pandemic used to be one of the things on that list. And the looks you used to get sometimes in these meetings where you say, so, you know, are you going to go as far as kind of like carrying on working during the event of a pandemic? And people would look at you and say, what, well, like the Black Death, you know, that was, was medieval times. We don't have that problem anymore. And then of course we have it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and we weren't prepared. Uh, however, you know, we, there's been lessons learned from that, you know, people are reacting. Uh, and looking at proactive ways to ensure that if that does happen again, we do have some processes in place. Well, this is it. I mean, because it dramatically changed the way we worked and the way, that, and, and you mentioned uh, in one of your, your previous comments, the communication factors, because the human species, we're so, we're so reliant on sitting next to one another to deal with a problem. You know, we, whenever I've seen incidents kick off, I mean, okay, yeah, sometimes if people are far, far away, you'll have like a, you know, a comms link to that group. But more often than not, the the response group would actually get together usually in the, in the same room or in the same environment to kind of spitball what they needed to do and who needed to do what. And then the pandemic happened and boom, not only did, you know, you have a security event that, that prevented you from sitting next to someone and actually having a conversation, a meaningful kind of conversation that involved body language and and, you know, making sure that that, that that people were were able to communicate collectively but you had uh the challenge of of the fact that you know if people had dodgy internet connections they couldn't get on the on the comms they couldn't start having those conversations so you know this this pandemic i think has shown a lot of people uh, a real incident a proper incident, something that there is literally nothing you can do about. It's just, boom, you're in the middle of a massive problem. And what do you do? Um, do you see that, that, that uh, this pandemic is going to change things going forward? I do, yeah, definitely. I think people are going to be more aware of incident response and looking at the bigger picture. Um, another fallout from the pandemic was not only that people's internet connectivity perhaps wasn't wonderful at home, but also, there were suddenly people who had desktops who had to work from home, and even you know, twelve hours they were allowed back in the office. Um, and I have um, friends in various organisation businesses who suddenly had to use their own devices, and there we go to bring your own device to work. And we look at the security yeah. implications around that. And actually, you know, as somebody in the IT department, how do you how do you go about? ensuring that all the configs are correct how do you make sure that they're all updated that in itself was a massive piece of work for the infrastructure team and you know the tvm space making sure that the people who did suddenly have to use their own devices for work purposes um you know weren't a risk uh further risk to the business well this is it and again I, you know, we came up against a lot of that with our customers um you know how do we do this securely you know everybody went from like a a trusted internal kind of centralized environment to a zero trust distributed environment, you know, and, and you mentioned a good point, you know, bring your own device. Um, we've had massive supply chain issues throughout this whole process, whether you blame it on the pandemic, whether you blame it on, the, you know, the war, whether you blame it on, you know, a variety of different issues. And, and it's probably a collection of issues, but, you know, just getting laptops nowadays in any decent amount. If you've got like, say, five new members of staff, you might not be able to get five new laptops for those individuals. And yeah, some companies hold big stacks of them, but a lot of companies don't. So you you end up running instant responses based off of something simple as, as much as, you know, a supply chain issue whereby how do you get members of staff either with busted laptops that aren't recoverable or um you know new starters who've got who need to have a laptop how do you facilitate them i mean if you're a small business okay yeah you know you run that risk that you might have to, you you can kind of plan for it but if you're a very much larger business there's, there's a much bigger budgetary implication in um an issue in the supply chain because you know no one's going to go out and buy a 1,000 laptops just in case they suddenly 
acquire another company or merge with another company. And if you, again, it's almost like going back to that whole prepping thing, isn't it? You know, the internet community of preppers on YouTube, um, I've, I've always loved their videos because they're always saying, prepare forward. Don't wait for the instant to kick off and then prepare because you're going you're gonna to come up short. And they're absolutely right as well. Okay, yeah, maybe not some of the doomsday guys who like to sit around in uh, bunkers in the middle of Canada. Um, not We don't like you guys, if you're watching. No, no, we love those guys. Uh, yeah, doomsday yeah. bunkers definitely are my favourites. Um, <laughs> like. but, uh, but, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's – it's important, you, pre- you know, and these guys are right. You prep forward. You test your preparations as well. Um, you know, it's same with BCP and DR. You, you prep that. But, you know, I mean, I think in many cases, a lot of the difficulties is how do you run through an event um, in a way that is meaningful without actually running through the event? You know, there's not many people who go into, say, their data center and just turn a rack of machines off just to see, how the failover kicks in, um, and I think what what I like about you guys is is, and we'll get into kind of what you guys do in a second. You know, there's also measure. How do you measure your decision making process? You know, across different levels, because you've got the business people who are making one set of decisions. Then you have, say, the marketing department and the PR department, kind of working out a way to how they're going to frame it to, say, the general public or the customers. Then you have the IT people who are making decisions themselves on how, you know, how the hell are we going to recover from, from this ransomware. And the security people who are like, right, where did they get in? How did they get in? What methods do they use? And can we find any back doors they've put in? And and with you guys, and, and we'll, we'll go into it in a second, I think you guys have really found a way to really kind of nail that. And I think it's a... And it, an important part of, of instant response and you know wargaming that isn't done. I mean, in the military, just out of interest, when you do do like the big wargaming where you've maybe got multiple departments and boots on the ground, how do they assess their their uh, effectiveness? Do they is it overall effectiveness or do they look at the different levels and the decision making process? How how is it done? I think each each exercise is different depending on what the overall goal is. Um, but I think a lot of the lessons and um, they identify the value in the wash up. Mm. That's where you figure out what went well, what didn't go well, um, what you should, you know, what they should be looking at for the next one. So I, and I think that's very much like military life. Sometimes they have an overall like, higher like objective. But actually, they're utilising the exercise to see what actually plays out in real life because that's something that we can't control. So they try not to make them too focused for that very reason because life throws all sorts of challenges at us. Do they often throw curveballs in as well? Do you do they like run an event and then suddenly just put something completely randomly in to they kind do of indeed. throw everybody off? Yeah, 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 yeah. Massive curveballs to make it both physically and mentally challenging. You're going to go back to the gassing. One of my, the worst ones of my life was somebody who had to run for the helicopter. But, oh no, there was a gas attack. So then now we had to do it with the respirator on, which made it just horrendous after we, you know, spent 23 hours in a field uh, figuring out how to get our comms up. Um, so yeah, lots of curveballs. <laughs> Do you think it's important to include curveballs in in your like you know in your instant response kind of workshops when you're doing the that war gaming when you're trying to test your your instant response rather than having a, a from you know A to B kind of set of this is the scenario this is how it's going to run do you think it's important to 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 occasionally throw in those curveballs just to see how you know really how the team adapts because if you've got a linear scenario all the time, then you're going to get kind of like a linear result at the end of it. Oh, with curve, yeah, with yeah. curveballs, you, you you get to see that mental process. And and I've done similar kind of stuff. You know, we've done tabletop kind of exercises. And normally, what we do is I'll do two kind of like lead exercises where it's linear, 
Um, you kind of talk them through the process. You let them kind of make that decision, but you prod them for when when they're obviously sort of flagging a bit. And then I always do a third scenario where it's like, right, you, you're going to respond now. This is it. You know, you are going to take everything you've learned and you're going to respond. I'm not going to get involved. Um, and all you do is you react to them. You throw in curveballs. And it's interesting because some people buckle. And some people buckle really quickly. And some people kind of shine. I remember one incident. I won't say who 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 this was with or which which individual group this was. They spent forty five minutes arguing over, over whose fault it would be if it went wrong, and this was a hypothetical scenario. Yeah, but that's typical of what happens when it's a hypothetical scenario. The decisions don't always get made, and people look to blame one another for what's gone wrong. And that you know that is something we see and. Um, in everyday life scenarios. So it's quite funny that you brought that particular uh, example up. Well, nobody wants to take the blame, do they? And, and let's face no. it, finger pointing during incidents and, and, and when issues occur is it's pretty rife. I think, I think it's fair to say it's, it's an aspect of business that, that we've all experienced at one point or another, especially if somebody knows they've done wrong and it's like, oh, I, I don't really want to get caught with this one. Um, 100%, such as the engineer that flicks that switch in the server room by mistake <laughs> and uh, picks up from offline. But the curveballs as well, I think that, that sort of goes back to your exercising maturity as an organisation. So if yeah. you're a and you haven't been used to exercising, you haven't been practising those BCP plans that you just have to lift out a couple of ideas, I'd probably say, you know, in the first instance, perhaps do do a couple of linear ones, as you do with your clients, mm. and then throw curveballs in because actually as we all know storms t- can you know happen all at once for example you could get an environmental situation which affects your connectivity and then you could get a cyber attack at the same time so not only you have reduced comms you know have the cyber element of it so i think it's always good to remember that there are always extra things which can influence our incident response plans which again is why exercising and repeatable exercising is so important Actually, you mentioned something quite interesting there, you know, that the events tend to, you know, you, you tend to get kind of, I'm seeing a lot of blended attacks these days. It's like, you know, access brokers will get into a network um, and they'll leave back doors in and then they'll sell those that back door access to other ne'er-do-wells, malicious actors, however you want to term them. Obviously, the ransomware guys want to get in, steal the data, exfiltrate it out and then encrypt it and then and then, you know, screw you over that way um but then you'll have other criminal gangs who might be crawling all over your network trying to find connections into other other areas so you could end up in a situation where it's not necessarily one instant you're dealing with it's actually three at the same time because in one case you're trying to find how how the access brokers got in and what back doors they're putting in because access brokers are like ticks once they're in it's really difficult to dig out what they've done you know um the ransomware guys are all kicking off a, you know one on one side of the fence which let's face it that's that's pretty scary when it happens I've, I've been involved in a few incidents with customers where they've come for help and you know i think people underestimate how actually scary a ransomware attack is and how fast that is as well but then you know when you also have people doing all, all kinds of other stuff like you know messing around with your website putting up you know stealing your emails and releasing them online I mean, that's kind of what the ransomware guys are doing as well. You can end up running like four different incident responses at the same time with the same team. And that must be pretty scary. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And I think this this is kind of the important part of, of what we're here to talk about today because in order for you to even deal with one incident, you need to be prepped, you need to be careful. And compliance also, look at PCI DSS, it actually requires you to test your incident response programs. We're starting to see ISO doing the same thing. A lot of other kind of compliance frameworks are now saying it's not enough for you to just have a process in place anymore. You actually have to test that process. And um, evidence and then, it as well. You have absolutely. Evidence. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, you're not passing your PCI DSS report on compliance if you you know, if you say you've done your, your instant response, but you've got absolutely nothing to show the auditor aka someone like myself that you've actually done it what the outcome was 
you know, what the scenario was, how it worked through, how it played through. So, yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. I mean, are you are you have you noticed a, a massive uptick? I mean, you guys are you guys are there. You're the vendor on the floor with the product to do this. Are you seeing a significant uptick in people interested in incident response? Has it been like a very fast one since the pandemic? Has it been maybe slow up until the pandemic and then it spiked real way upwards and then come back down? What trends are you you guys kind of seeing in the market at the moment? I think the trend, I mean, historically, we all know that WannaCry, the Eternal Blue exploit, made everybody a little bit more proactive when it came to the incident response. Um, so, we, yeah, we have had spikes, then COVID came along. Um, and I think people are just more cyber aware. Certainly, as a company, we have seen more and more um, big players uh, come to us and say they want to practice their doom based scenarios. They want to see if their processes work. They actually want to test them in real life. And as you and I both know, when you run a tabletop exercise uh, in the, the old fashioned way, you get a bunch of people in a room, there'd be a PowerPoint presentation. And you get to discussion points and you discuss, but actually no key decisions were ever made. Um, so, you know, where do you go from that? It's just a lot of people assigning blame um, and throwing it across the room. So definitely, as a, yeah, definitely as a company, uh, we're seeing more and more people reach out um, about this particular product, the Immersive Labs, um, called Crisis Simulator, which enables their companies to exercise and evidence um, their doomsday scenarios. Who, who are you finding asking that? Because, I mean, is it CISO level uh, sort of people? Is it security management? Is it IT? Or is it and the actual business kind of the C-suite, you know, the finance directors, the owners, the MDs, the CEOs, whatever you want to term it? What levels are you seeing, you know, trends in who's asking? Because I'm guessing it's, it's you know, they, they must be pretty high up in the chain if they're interested in, in doomsday uh, potential events. Indeed, yeah. So we, we're seeing these requests come from CISOs, managing directors, everybody is suddenly understanding the importance of cyber resilience. Um, and, you know, largely due to the pandemic and our different ways of working. So CISOs, people in the compliance space, financial directors, and we're talking across different industries as well. We've seen the healthcare industry, financial industry, um, the oil and gas industry, you know, we look at the colonial pipeline issue. Um, there are multiple uh, industry sectors coming to us and asking us, you know, do we have content um, with our product which will enable them to practice their doomsday scenarios? Actually, so you mentioned the sector. What about the insurance sector? Because it, I'm starting to see a lot of problems in, in cyber insurance, you know. I think in the early days, it was the sexy thing to have cyber insurance. And then the first... The first couple of really big events kicked off, and it kind of scared the insurance industry because they suddenly saw how much this this could actually get to. I mean, some of the early events that were well publicised, I'm sure there was plenty that weren't, you know, were worth millions and billions in some respects that were trying to be claimed back. And insurance, I know at least one incident where where it was, I think they were. Of being taken to the insurance company was being taken to court for a billion dollars because they wouldn't pay out on their on the cyber insurance. Um, a well known a well known pharmaceutical company, um, and you know, insurance is really. I mean, I, I come from a reinsurance and insurance background. That was where I cut my teeth in in information security. And with those guys, you know, they, they like to know the countermeasures you have in place to protect against events from occurring. Um, is it going to become more and more important to show organizations such as insurance companies, if you want to get that that cyber insurance, to prove that you've got a working process? Do you, is that something that you guys see as, as poss a possibility going forward? I think that's a definite possibility. So as we know, uh, we look at ransomware attacks. Um, a lot of the uh, the ransomware uh, attackers uh, are aware of what cyber insurance policy a company will have, and they will place their ransom at a price they know the insurance will pay out of. So the insurances are really looking at ways, well, actually, how can we ensure we don't pay out, right? And that's going to be by a company 
not only practicing and exercising the incident responses, but evidence in it saying, yes, look, here, these are the key decisions we made. This is the fallout. This are the improvements we've made. Because equally, there are always improvements in business, right? That's one part of, you know, the like continuous service improvement. It's a thing for a reason. And, um, you know, our environment changes, the cyber landscape changes. So we always need to remain agile. And that's another great thing about the crisis sim uh, product is not only do we have a catalogue of doomsday scenarios for people to select um, across like, all different types of um, industries, uh, you, you know, you have the ability to build your own. We've recently launched some crisis sim templates, which cover the six top sort of um, attack vectors, as you were. Uh, and we've had some great feedback from organizations saying it's been a real enabler. And each of these templates is supported by a rich media pack, so you can really bring them to life. You know, you can have people talking in them, you can have video clips, you can have your processes in them. Um, so you can really effectively test your key decision making. And equally part of the crisis sim is on being provided an injects or snippet of information, you're given options and you have to choose an option to progress. Mm. So the great thing about that is, you know, a decision is made and you will get feedback and the feedback could be metrics, which again can be bespoke. So for the oil and gas industry, it might, you know, the price of price of gas, you could have a reputational metric on the side. Um, but the great thing, as I said, is we can really custom that, customize that. Um, and in fact, Immersive Labs also have a professional services team. So if there's a customer struggling with how to build a crisis sim, they're not quite sure what to do, they want to facilitate an event at a global level. And again, that's the beauty of our product. It's cloud-based. You can do this anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've got half your organization in the States, half them in the UK. This is something that we can facilitate. And we have specialist consultants who are running, exercising at executive levels so they can test these doomsday scenarios so they can ask questions and we have found that when they have done it once they want to come back they want to do more because that's another key in exercise and you have to repeat it absolutely i think you know i mean i've, I've seen the, the your, your platform and i love the fact you can customize your own and and as i said before you know you can you can almost create two or three events kicking off at the same time to throw that curveball in to to scare maybe not scare but you know I tend to find you know if you give people one thing to think of they tend to be they tend to be okay with it and they'll they'll go through it if you chuck extra stuff in there that that really chucks as we termed earlier on that curveball you really start to see how people sort of like work under pressure and it's imp important to know that especially during an incident um how are people going to respond what's the you know where are the weaker points in your in your decision making process does it does it rest at the top level are they too slow to respond too slow to to make a decision for fear you know because you've got that human aspect haven't you where you know, not making a decision is is almost preferable to making a decision because once you commit yourself to something, if it's wrong, you're like, oh no, I went wrong. So yeah, you know, I, what I like about the crisis sim uh, that you guys have as well is that it's not just kind of a a, a yes or a no decision making process. It's not like either one decision or another decision. You can actually put in multiple different avenues for the decision maker to go down and you can weight each of those decisions independently and i presume that kind of gives a score at the end that you know in the final report you can see okay yeah our, our middle management you know made some pretty pretty silly decisions whereas our top top management kind of you know they hit the nail on the head is is, is that that what you can do within the the, the actual solution itself yeah, so when you select your options after you've given your information, you will get feedback. And again, you can get the feedback straight after you've answered the option or you can get it at the end. Um, it depends entirely on, you know, what you want to do. Um, and it will give you feedback and it will tell you, you know, that was a good answer. That wasn't so great. And it will tell you why, because the feedback is really important in the whole cycle. Another great thing to know about it is you can play it in three different modes. So you can play it as a single player. So if you wanted to perhaps want to one -to -one assign a team member a particular sim if you think it would be good for their development you can do that and they can go away and do it uh you know you could have it in presentation mode wonderful for executives or you have to have team building days 
where uh, you can put it up on the screen. All, all anyone needs to access it is a smart device because you um, get a click the code to join the event. Um, and you can do it as a room. Also, what's lovely about that is how you answer is anonymous. So you tend to get people engaging a little bit more. Again, they're not worried about being blamed, right, about putting on the spot. So then what you'll see is uh, next to each option, a percentage of how many audience members have answered that question. And then as a room, you go, go, OK, so 50 percent of us said this answer. Well, let's go with that and see where that takes us. So that's really nice if you've got, again, the inexperienced exercises wanting to sort of start off. Let's talk a bit about the waiting aspect of the decision making process, because it's it's not like a linear yes or no. There is actually kind of like a methodology whereby you can do a range of different answers, you know, some very good, some very bad, and some that maybe sit there in the middle as part of that kind of reporting process at the end when giving feedback uh, to the bosses or whoever's running the event on how individual departments or people or whatever did. And I know you've got different modes. Do you want to quickly just go over that? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so the waiting, yes, you're right. So when you have your information, you'll get a few options. And depending on what you select, you'll, you'll get some feedback. That was the great answer. That was an OK answer. And it wouldn't be the worst case scenario if you chose this. This is a weak answer. Uh, and you can choose to have the feedback after each sort of inject, or you can have it at the end as an overall report. Now, an add-on bonus to this is the ways you can play the crisis simulator. So you could do it as individuals, and you might, as a manager, decide to you know assign one to a member of your team. Um, you can do it as a uh, presentation mode. Great for team get-togethers. Great for executives. Um, and also, you know, an exec never likes to be called out. I'm just going to throw that out there. And the great thing about presentation mode is it's anonymous. So all you need to play is a smart device. You sign up to the URL, put your code on, you'll play an event. And how this works is when you reveal the options, the room will vote. And you'll see on the, the screen, on the facilitator screen, a percentage. So 50% of the room answered B. So as a group, you probably discuss like why you chose B and why you didn't go for the other options. So it enables discussion as well. Uh, and then you've moved forward through the crisis sim to the next inject, you know, once you've selected the option that you've decided to go with as a route. The next mode is the drill mode. Now, I quite like this personally, as I think it mirrors a real incident response. As you called out earlier, you'd have the incident responders dealing with the incident, but perhaps you need the support of the media team. They're going to be the ones who know to go to the media and one not hold their hands up and go, it's all us, blame us. But they're also going to go, there's nothing going on here. Things are absolutely fine. When the world knows something's up, right? So um, what you might have is an inject, which is just for the media team. Okay. And that's a pretty cool way of doing it. Because I think that's how whenever you run a bridge, you have more than one role there. Because mm. you need different expertise from different you know, parts of your organization. So I think drill modes are pretty cool as well. If you perhaps wanted as an incident management to run the response. Um, so yeah, there's a different mode, I think, for each level of an organization, going from the workforce to the executives, you know, to your specialist teams. I think that's another great way that we can uh, look to use the product. I like that idea, actually, because what you, what you can do, obviously, by the sounds of it in drill mode is, you know, somebody in marketing or PR, they're not going to be interested in the intricate details of what the decision-making process is for the IT team on what they're going to do on the back end of the solution. You know, they're more interested in what's happening, how long is it going to be down, what do I need to be able to say, what do I not, not be able to say. And I suppose, I presume with drill mode, you can actually kind of just tailor it to this is the instant, this is the brief that you've been given from the IT department or the security department. The, you know, you run your bit. So you almost get like a report for them and then you get a report for the IT team and the report for management. You can actually break it down. Well, so no, not from the report. I said what, what it will do is you'll get the overall report from the scenario. And obviously, we're always looking to develop any, everything in the platform. But what it mm -hmm. does is that each inject, it will say your role at this inject is media team or incident response. So the players in the room know Hey, that's my bet. I now need to step up. Good. No, that's great because, um, yeah, if it's totally anonymous all the way through, then, you know, you can't give the kudos to the teams that did well throughout the exercise as much as obviously maybe retrain some of the people who didn't do so well. 
Um, I think it is a know, team effort. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it takes a it takes a lot of jigsaw pieces to to get that that puzzle put together and to to come out of a, an instant clean. But part of any kind of instant response process, same with change control, same with any other process, is to review what your lessons learned at the end of that is. And that's a really important part. And identifying flaws maybe in technology or decision-making processes or, you know, individuals. You know, I mean, it's not nice to get, but this is how we improve. You know, I'm guessing it was the same in the Army back in the day. If you did something that, that wasn't optimum, then I'm guessing you got a, you got either told nicely or a real serious dressing down if it was something really, really yeah, bad. Yeah, that, that was normally known as jankers. Uh, it's normally <laughs> the great task of perhaps painting the grass green or uh, yeah, <laughs> just some ultimate, ultimate like dire task which was like there to destroy your soul. Um, I think though, perhaps the simulator's great, greatest strength is the scope it provides to organisations to develop content aligned to their actual sectors, risks, and frameworks. Mm. Um, I think. The flexibility of the mechanisms of crisis sim just makes it relevant to everybody. You know, every organization, every workforce can get something out of that. And then looking back at the sort of the life cycle, as you say, in the PRR and PIR rather, in the wash up, um, you know, in your reports, whatever you, you know, you find is you can go back into the platform and utilize something else to upskill yourself and then you can track your progress your next exercise for example you know if you see that you know you perhaps you perhaps your workforce doesn't really know what phishing is because you know mm. that does exist in the workforce still we have labs and content on that which they can go be assigned do come back repeat your exercise in four months time is there a difference yes uh, we have human psychologists at immersive labs um because we need to understand how the human brain works when dealing with incidents when looking at cyber and they've actually through their studies found that the repeatable exercising needs to happen around every eight weeks for us as humans to sort of learn from it and actually apply our learning into everyday life situations so really immersive labs looks at like the bigger picture we understand that there is a process to exercising, that we don't, don't want to just exercise you and then leave you be. We want to, like, help. We want to uplift you. We want to provide those opportunities, you know, to upskill, to exercise, to evidence, to do all those things that you need to ensure that your organisation is resilient. And that's a really good point, actually, you know. Uh, and, and, again, you know, when I've seen incident response done kind of, you know, uh, trained and war game through you don't tend to run the same scenario twice you tend to kind of either mix it up or you change it but there is there is methods of madness there if you've got a risk that kicks off and you know it kicks off at least once or twice a year and there's 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 not much you can do but there's a process that you can follow to kind of recover quickly from it say you know once a year you know um the, for some reason the power goes off in the data center and you don't know why you know, um, and it's happened every year for the last three years. You can actually, you know, war game the scenario through, take what you've learned. When it does happen, take the non the information that you got from that, and it it ceases to be incident response kind of testing and becomes training. Really, you know, you've you've created the scenario that you know happens from time to time. You know, it is a okay. You don't know when it's going to happen, but it's it's almost a playbook at that point. Here's our playbook for if this happens. You know. Um, it's quite interesting. It's, it, there's there's a lot of applications for this this type of products, and I I, I, I do like it. I must admit, um, and I'm not biased at all um, on this one. Believe it or not, I actually genuinely love the product. Um, I just like the as I t as I like to make it down to basic terms. It's like the choose your own adventures I had as a kid. You know, you can you can yeah, exactly. build, you you can ha you can have fun with it. You can run yourself through a scenario. But equally, you can build complex scenarios if you really want to, to really test your teams. And there's a lot of different applications for this particular type of product. And it's good that we've got them because if you go back five, ten years, we didn't have these. We didn't have the, any of this stuff at all. You know, no, it's, it was like, all... It's, it's like a sandbox environment for decision making, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can know. go make that decision and it doesn't matter if you make the wrong one because you can learn from it. But equally, exactly. it can give you confidence that your process, your decision making, does work. No, it's great, and I th I think it's a, an integral part of of 
governments going forward, you know, um, there are certain things that you must have in any information security department. Risk management, obvious, you know, you need to have that. But instant response is the other really big one. Um, obviously, you've got your policies, your procedures, you've got your people, your processes, technology. But but the real core of, of security, it's, it's not preventing an event necessarily from occurring because you can't predict that. It's how you respond when an event does kick off and how you, you, you know, you recover from that. You can either recover very messily and learn something and then apply what you've learned, or you can, you know, do brilliantly and then record it down for future use for, for in case that kind of event happens again. And it gives you valuable data as well. I love the fact that you guys use, you know, human psychology behind how you develop your product, because at the end of the day, human psychology again is an integral and interesting part of information security because you know information security is run by people until the ai takes over and we all you know we all end up in a terminator kind of environment um it's still going to be humans making those decisions um and i think it's great that you guys are evolving with what you've learned and and through talking to customers because i know we've we've spoken a number of times with members of your team about some some ideas and you guys are really open to it as well so i can see that the the you know the product is gonna is gonna evolve brilliantly going forward and and for all of you guys out there who who are feasibly interested just get in touch get in touch with us or get in touch with you know immersive um sort of mention raise thorn just say I, I saw the video whatever uh the spotlight on technology um and just get a demo they're nice people. We are nice people. <laughs> <laughs> that well, is very, we genuinely are, I promise. And Let they're quite see. interesting as well. Thanks, James. I'll take that as a compliment. It is. It is. Uh, well, Marie, the time has come. Uh, we're, we're on our way out now. Um, thank you ever so much for coming on the spotlight and kind of introducing us uh, to the world of Crisis Sim. Uh, and instant response and instant response testing. I think I think it's a, a, a well overlooked area of infosec that, that that we definitely needed to cover. And uh, I think maybe I'm going to put some of some of the instant response pieces on the podcast. So you you may you may hear Marie again in the future on the podcast if you're lucky. Um, so thank you very much, Marie. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, thanks for having us um, on the uh, the spotlight, James. And I've no doubt I will be speaking again soon. Take care, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much to everybody out there for watching this. And we will be seeing you soon.